Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2022. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure the book is in front of you when you're working with me. Today, we'll solve data sufficiency problems. Today is day number 11. As you know, on the first 10 days, day 1 through 10, we, we, have been, we had been solving the problem solving questions. Today, we'll do data sufficiency questions. Before we begin, let's quickly go through all of the answer choices, what they mean. Answer choice A means statement, statement 1 by itself is enough, but statement 2 by itself is not enough. That's important to understand. Answer choice B means that 2 alone, statement number 2 is alone is enough, but statement 1 by itself is not enough. Because if each of the statements alone were enough by themselves, the answer is D. If we need information from both statement 1 and 2, then the answer is C. We need both. And even after putting the information from statement 1 and statement 2 together, if we still cannot answer it, the answer is E. Let's begin. Very first problem. Number 263. On page 261, the very first data sufficiency problem is number 263. In number 263, they are asking us how many how many pages there are, how many pages there are in the book. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that the each page, each page we are told is eight by five and a half. Can we figure out how many pages there are in the book simply by knowing the size of each page? Of course not. The statement one by itself is no good. Let's look at statement 2. Statement 2 says that we have 250 words per page. Simply knowing that there are 250 words per page on average in a book, we cannot figure out the number of pages. And even when we put them together, knowing how many words there are per page on average and what the size of the page is does not tell us how many pages there are in the book. The answer is E. Answer of this problem is E. Let's look at next one. Number 264. Number 264 says that we have a vase. And in that vase we are told that we have two kinds of flowers. Roses and tulips. Let's see what they can do. So we have roses and tulips in the vase and nothing else. Just only two kinds of flowers. 264. Vase has... has Roses and tulips, and we, what we want to find out is how many tulips we have. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us the number of roses that we have is four times the number of tulips. Simply rowing that the ratio is one to four does not tell us how many flowers there are in the vase, of course. Statement one by itself is no good. The statement two tells us that there are 20 total flowers. Roses and tulips, all together, there are 20 of them. Again, remember, when you're looking at statement number 2, we cannot use any information from statement 1. So just by looking at statement number 2 and simply knowing that there are 20 flowers in the vase does not enable us to figure out the number of tulips. Second statement by itself is not good. No good. But when we put them together, of course, we are home free because now we have two independent equations. We have two unknowns. We can figure out the roses and tulips. We don't actually have to do it. We simply have to understand that we have enough data. We have two equations, two unknowns. It can be done. It can be done. The answer is C. Putting the two information together, we need both statement 1 and 2 to figure out the answer. 265. Don't sit there and actually waste your time solving it. You understand? 265. In 265, we are given this picture. This is the origin. And this is M, N, and P, and the question is, what are the coordinates of point N? Well, the coordinates of point N, the X coordinates, of course, very straightforward, is zero. What we want to find out the Y coordinate, which is, in other words, we want to find out this height. That's what they're looking for. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that the triangle M and P is equilateral. That's an equilateral triangle, which means that if this side is X, so is this side, and from here to here, it's going to be half x. Now simply knowing that this is x, x, and half x does not enable us to figure out this height right here. The statement 1 by itself is no good. The statement 2 tells us that the coordinates of point M are negative 4 and 0. 
Again, when you're looking at second statement, don't look at the first statement. It doesn't exist. We're not looking at any of this information. All we know is that from here to here is 4. Just by that information alone, we cannot figure out what the answer is. Let's put it here. A, D, B, C, E. So the first statement by itself was no good, which means the answer cannot be A, O, D. Second statement by itself is no good, which means the answer cannot be B. It has to be either C or E. When we put them together, now we can solve it because we know distance from here to here is 4, which means this distance right here is also 4. It's also 4, and since this equilateral triangle from M to P must be 8, which means this side is also 8, this side is 8. And that's it, we can figure out the height. The height here, let's call it edge, you can very easily figure out. Height is simply going to be, height squared is going to be simply 8 squared minus 4 squared. Again, we don't have to actually do it, you understand? Simple application of Pythagorean theorem does the job, which means the putting the two statements together enables us to answer the question, what are the coordinates of point N? We can figure it out. The answer is C. 266. 266 says that n times x, 266, oh sorry, uh, 266 says that if we buy 10 pounds of, uh, 10 apples, if we buy 10 apples and 2 grapes, 2 grapes, the total cost is $12. A represents the price of apple, G represents the price of grapes. And what we want to find out, what we want to find out is the price of apple. Let's see what it tells us. The first equation tells us that the grape costs two dollars. Well, there we go. If grape costs two dollars, we can put it in here and solve for A. The first statement by itself is enough. A, D, B, C, E, which means if the first statement by itself is enough, which means the answer cannot be B, C, or E, it will have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that the cost of two apples, the cost of two apples is less than the cost of a grape. Simply knowing that the two apples cost less than what, co what, what the cost of a, of a grape is, does not tell us what the price of apple is. Second statement by itself is no good. The answer is A. The statement A, statement number 1 by itself is enough for us to be able to answer the question. Statement 2 by itself is not enough. 267. 267 is asking us for the median salary. What is the median salary in this form? Let's see what they tell us. Let's see what they tell us about the firm. In the first sentence, they tell us, in the first sentence, they tell us there are 29 employees. Knowing that there are 29 employees tells us that there are 14 of them here, there are 14 of them there, and this 15th guy, this 15th guy is our median. And that's the, that's the salary we want to find out. When we arrange the salary from ascending or descending order, the 15th entry is the median but we still don't know what that 15th entry is. The first statement by itself is no good. A, D, B, C, E. Since the first statement by itself is no good, the answer cannot be A or D, it will have to be B, C, or E. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that 12 had salary of $24,000. Knowing that 12 of the people out of these 29 people had a salary of exactly $24,000 does not tell us what the median is. Second statement also by itself is no good. And even when we put them together, knowing that there are 29 employees of which 12 of them have a salary of exactly $24,000 does not in any shape or form tell us what the median is. The answer is E. 't over analyze them do you understand when there is not enough information we just move on that was number 267 let's look at 268 in the next column in 268 we are told that n times x equals 250 y what we want to find out is what's the value of n let's see what they tell us the first statement tells us that 100 x equals 
625 y. Is that information enough to figure out the value of n? The answer is yes. I hope you are able to see that right away. The first statement by itself does the job nicely. A, D, B, C, E. Since the first statement by itself is not, the answer cannot be B, C, E, or E. We don't actually have to do it, but here, just to satisfy your curiosity, I'm going to very quickly figure it out, show you how to actually figure it out if we had to do it. So divide both sides by 625. That takes care of this part. We have y by itself. We don't want a y. We want 250y. So multiply both sides by 250, and that's that's it. That's that's your answer. This is your answer. Divide top and bottom by 25. This becomes 10. This becomes 25. Divide by 25 again. There you go. The answer is 40. 10 times 4. But we didn't, we didn't actually have to do it. Do you understand? The first statement by itself is enough. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that 2000x equals 12,500y. If that statement by itself was enough, this equation of course by itself is also enough. Each of the statement by itself is enough, the answer is D. And again, if we had to do it, we don't have to do it, but if we had to do it, it's very straightforward. We want 250y here, multiply both sides by 2. If we both multiply both sides by 2, 12,500 12, times 2 is going to give us 25,000. We don't want 25,000, we only want 250. So divide both sides by 100. Divide both sides by 100, and here we go. 125 times 2 is 250, and the answer is 40, just like before. Before it was 10 times 4, now it is 2 times 20. The answer is D. Two sixty nine. In two sixty nine, we want to find out the coordinates of the four vertices of a square J, K, M, N. The first statement tells us that J and M, point J and M, J and M lie on x-axis. And they also tell us that K and N lie on y-axis. So let's see what the, what the square actually looks like. So J and M lie on x-axis, maybe, maybe J is here and M is here, J and M. K and N lie on Y axis, maybe K is over here, and N is over there maybe. And as you can clearly see, that is not the square we are looking at because it's not a square. That's not how the points are sitting. The way the points are sitting looks something like this. J and M, right there, distance from J to or origin is same as O to, so these are the same distances. And similarly, K and N, K and N, right there. And the square that we're looking at looks something like this. But that does not tell us what the vertices are of each of the, or the if, what the vertices, what the coordinates are of each of the vertices. The first statement by itself is no good. A, D, B, C, E. Oh, sorry. The first statement is not enough. Answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that the center of this square is 0, 0. But the center of the square is at the origin. It's clearly we could see it from here, from the first statement alone, that is centered around origin. Simply knowing the sitting around origin adds no new information to us. Second statement by itself is no good. What's more is that even when we put them together, still we're not going to get anywhere. There is no way to figure out the word coordinates of the vertices. The answer is C. 269. Well, that was 269. Let's move on to 270. In 270, we are told that we're going to buy three printers. We're going to buy three printers and one scanner. S represents the price of the scanner, P represents the price of a printer, obviously. And what we find out is, how much does one scanner cost? Let's see what they tell us. 
the first segment tells us that the total spent was $1,300. We spent a total of $1,300 on buying these three, three printers and one scanner, which means 3P three, three plus 1S equals $1,300. That by itself does not enable us to figure out the S, because we have two unknowns, it's only one equation. Let's see what the second statement tells us. The first statement does not do the job. A, D, B, C, E. Second statement tells us that the price of a scanner, or price of a printer rather, the second statement tells us the price of the printer is four times the price of a scanner. In other words, printer costs four times as much as what a scanner costs. Again, that by itself, that by itself is not going to tell us what the price of a scanner is. Second statement by itself is not enough. But when we put them together, when we put the two statements together, we can do the job because we have two equations, two unknowns, we can solve for P and S. Let's solve the answer is C. Just put P is equal to 4S, we put it in here. P is equal to 4S, it's replaced this S with 4, uh, replaced with this P with 4S, we're going to end up with 4S plus 1S5. P is equal to 4S. Oh, we put 4S in here, that will become 3 times 4 is 12, 12S plus 1S is 13S, 13S equals 1300, S equals 100. Well, as you can see, the time it took me a few seconds to figure out what the price of the S was, in the real exam, it would have been a waste of time, a sheer waste of time, because we don't have to figure it out. We simply have to understand that it can be done. We have sufficient data. 271. In 271, we have a triangle here. And we are told that this is 20, this is A, B, C and D, and the question is how much is this angle? Let's see what they tell us. How much is angle B, A, C? The first statement tells us that angle B, D, C is 60. Let's see if that's, that by itself is enough for us to figure out what angle B, A, C is. B, D, C, B, D, C, we are told is 60. Well, there you go. If that is 60, this must be 120. And that's 120, and that's a 20, that's, that's 140, x must be 40. The first statement does the job nicely. The first statement does the job nicely. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that the angle BAC, angle BAC is less than angle BCD. BAC, BAC. We are told that this angle, that one angle that we are trying to find, X here, is less than BCD. Knowing that this angle is less than that angle does not in any way help us figuring out, help us in figuring out what X is. Second statement by itself is no good. The answer is A. Only the first statement by itself is enough. To do the job, second statement by itself is not enough. 200 and 72. 200 and 72 on the next page. Let's see what we can do. Two seventy two tells us that we have two hundred and fifty six marbles, and we are told that the marbles are either blue, green, or purple. And what we want to find out is the ratio of blue to purple. That's what, that's what we want to find out. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that the number of green marbles we have is four times the number of blue marbles. So that's one equation. They give you our first equation right here, 256 equals B plus G plus P. So we have one equation here, they have another equation here. There's only two equations and we have three unknown. We cannot solve for three unknowns with just two equations. First statement by itself is not enough. If we have three unknowns, we need three independent equations obviously. The second equation tells sec second statement tells us that G equals 192. Again, simply knowing that G equals 192 here does not tell us what B and P are. Second statement by itself is also no good. But of course when we put them together, 
We have three equations, three unknowns. It can be done very easily. The answer is C. If we know what G is, G is 192, put the G in here, 192, we can figure out B. Once we have a B and the G, we can figure out the P. Don't sit there, don't sit there and actually do it out, do you understand? In 273, we are told that we are going to mix paint. We are going to mix paint, which is blue, yellow and red. And so we have three different colors, blue, yellow and red. We are going to mix them in this ratio. 2 to 3 to 1. We are also told that we have we have enough blue and red. We have enough of the blue red, uh, blue paint, we have enough of the red paint, we don't have to worry out run, we don't have to worry about running out of either one of those two. The question is, do we have enough yellow? That's what that's we want to find out. We know we have enough of the other two colors. Do I have enough yellow to make make this mixture which is in the ratio of 2 to 3 to 1. Let's see what that tells us. The first statement tells us that we need to me we need to make 20 quarts of mixture. The mixture that I'm making it has to be 20 quarts or 20 gallons or 20 liters, whatever you like, it doesn't matter. We need 20 units. Well what this tells us is that because because they are in the ratio of 2 to 3 to 1, yellow is 3 parts out of 6 parts. So what this tells us, what this implies is that we need 10 quarts of yellow. That's what it tells us. But do we have 10 quarts of yellow? It doesn't tell us that part. There is nothing in here. All we can figure out from here, all we can surmise from this thing, all we can surmise from that thing is that we need to make 20, 20 quarts of mixture and since mixture is made up of 50% yellow, we need 10 quarts of yellow. But we don't know, we still don't know if we have 10 quarts of yellow. The first statement does not do the job. Answer is not A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that we do have, in fact, 10 quarts of yellow. We do have 10 quarts of yellow. So don't be hasty. Answer is not B yet. When you're looking at second statement, we cannot look at the first statement. So what the second statement tells us is that we have 10 quarts of yellow. But at this point, we do not know how much, how much mixture we want to make. If you want to make 1,000 uh, quarts of uh, mixture, it's not enough. Because if you need 1,000, we need 500 gallons of yellow. On the other hand, if you only want to make 2 gallons of mixture, that's more than enough. We have no idea by itself. Second statement is not enough. It's only when we put the information from the first statement and second statement together, we know now that we have enough yellow because the first statement tells us that we want to make 10, 10 quarts of mixture. So therefore, we know we need 10, uh, 20 quarts of mixture and therefore we know that we need to, make, we need to have 10 quarts of yellow. And the second statement clearly tells us that we have 10 quarts of yellow. The answer is C. Two seventy-four. Two hundred and seventy-four. In two seventy-four, we have two groups, A and B. So there are two classes, class A and class B. The question is, is the average of A greater than the average of class B? These two classes, class A and class B, they have both taken an exam, exact same exam was given to the two classes, class A and class B. And what we want to find out is, is the average score on this test in class A higher than the average score in class B? Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us there are 10 students in A and 12 in B. Simply knowing that there are 10 students in one class and 12 in the other does not enable us to figure out if the average in one class is higher than the other. The first statement is not going to do anything. Therefore, answer cannot be A or D. The second statement tells us that the highest score highest score was earned by a, chief, by a student in class B and we also told that the lowest score lowest score on this exam the same exam that was given to the two classes we are told 
to the lowest score was achieved by somebody in class A. Simply knowing that the highest score was achieved by somebody in class B and the lowest was score on the exam was achieved by somebody in class A does not tell us if the average score in these two classes if this is greater than that. We cannot compare the average score simply by knowing the fact that the highest score was from one class and the lowest was from the other. It does not do the job. The answer is not B. Even when we put them together, knowing that the highest score was achieved by somebody in class B and the lowest was achieved by somebody in class A, and there are 10 in A and 10 in B, B you get the idea. The, it's not going to get us anywhere. We cannot figure out the average from here. As I said before, don't sit there and don't talk too much. It cannot be done. You should, you should be able to see it right away. 275. In 275, we are told that we have three departments. We have three departments. X, Y, and Z. These three departments, we are told, were given some money, some grant for research. Some research grant was given to these three departments, and what we want to find out is which department got the most dollar. Let's see what they tell us. Statement 1 tells us the ratio of x to y is 3 to 5. Simply knowing that the department y got more money than department x does not tell us which department out of these three got the most money. A, B, B, C, E which means first statement by itself is not enough. First statement does not do the job. Second statement tells us that the ratio of x to z is 2 to 1. Simply knowing that department x got more money than department z did, again does not tell us which, which department got the most money out of the three. But it's only when we put them together we can do the job, the answer is c. Now if you are able to see right away that when you put them together, if we know the ratio of x to y and if we know the ratio of x to z, we can figure out the ratio of x to y to z. If you are able to see that right away, we don't have to do any more work. We can move on to the next question. The answer is C. In case you, you do not see it, I'm going to actually very quickly do it out for you. So here we have x to y to z and we are told that x to y is 3 to 5. We are told that x to z is 2 to 1. And as you can see, as it stands right now, we cannot compare them because here we have a 3 and here we have a 2. We have to have the same number in x, which is a common, common, uh, common, common element. We have to make them same. We can make them same by multiplying this by 2. Because the ratio of 6 to 10 is same as the ratio of 3 to 5. And again, multiplying this thing by, th by 3. Again, because the ratio of 6 to 3 is same as 2 to 1. So now we have 6 here, we have 10 here, and we have 3 here. There we go. Which department got the most money? The answer is department Y got the most money. As a matter of fact, department Y got more money than department X and Z put together. For every $9 that were distributed between X and Z, Y got $10. So that was number 275. Let's move on. 276. In 276, we'll be asked average number of cans donated by students. So we have students in, this, in a certain class and they all brought some canned food to donate to some charities, to some food bank. They all brought some can of foods from uh, can of can of food cans of food from their home, and the question is, what was the average number of cans that were donated by these students? The first statement, first statement tells us that the 56 cans were donated. Simply knowing the total of 56 cans were donated does not tell us what the average number of cans was because we don't know how many students there are in the class. A D B C E. The answer is not A or D. The second statement tells us that the number of canes that were donated, the number of canes that were donated, we are told, is 40 more than the number of students. How many students there are in the class, 40 more than that is the number of canes that were donated. If there were 10 students in the class, the number of canes donated were 50. If there were 38, 
it was 78, you get the idea. But again, by itself, this information by itself does not tell us the average. There is no way to figure out the average because we know this information, we only have one equation and two unknown. The answer is not D. But when we put them together, of course, it's very straightforward. If this amount is 56, N must be 16. If N is 16, this is 56. The number of came donors is 56 over 16. No big deal. The answer is C. 277. Two hundred and seventy seven in the next column. We are told that no two salaries, no two salaries are same. So we have a firm in which we have number of employees and we are told that each person makes the amount of salary which is unique. No two people are paid the same amount of money. The question is what is the median salary? Let's see what that tells us. The first statement tells us that when we arrange the salaries in order, either ascending order or descending order, we are told that the median happens to be the 15th entry. Well, what this tells us is that there are 14 people on this side, 14 people on this side, this is the 15th entry, this is the median. So what this tells us is that, what this implies is that there must be 29, there must be 29 employees. That's all it tells us. So simply knowing that there are 29 employees in the firm does not enable us to figure out what the median is. The first statement by itself is not enough. The first statement by itself is not enough. Second statement tells us that the sum of the salary, sum of all the salaries, if you add up all of the salaries of the employees in the firm, it comes out to be $913,000. Again, that by itself does not enable us to figure out what the median is. Now, even when we put them together, we still cannot figure out the median. What they are hoping, the answer is E here. What they are hoping here, the people who write, wrote this question, what they are hoping is that, that, that you will misread the question and think that they are looking for mean. If they were asking for mean, not the median, if they were asking for mean, then the answer would have been C. We can figure out the mean, because the first, from first statement we can figure out there are 29 people. Second statement tells us the sum of, the, sum of all the employees, uh, sum of all the salaries. We just divide the sum by the 29 and we can figure out the average salary. But they're not looking for average salary, they're not asking for the mean salary, they're looking for median salary. And there is no way to figure out the median, the answer is E. Number 200. N88. Two hundred and seventy-eight rather. Number two hundred and seventy-eight. In number 278, we're looking for the number of number. Uh, we're looking for the ratio of four and against. Uh, there's a meeting going on there. There was a certain proposal proposal that was made, and people voted either in favor of it or against it. And the question is, what's the ratio? What's the ratio of the number of people who voted in favor of it against uh, versus the number of people who again voted against it? Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement they tell us the number of people who number number of people who voted in favor of it is 60 more than the number of people who voted against it. In other words, this ratio that we're looking for, this ratio that we're looking for, the number of people who voted in favor of it is 60 more than the number of people who voted against it. But we still don't know what the ratio is. There is no way to figure out this ratio from that information alone. First statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. The first statement by itself is not enough. Let's see what the second statement tells us. The second statement tells us the number of people who voted in favor of it is 240. Again, that, that information by itself, simply knowing the number of people who voted in favor is 240. So in the second statement, they tell us the, the, the numerator, but we still have no idea what the denominator is. It is not enough. It is only when we put the information from the two statements together, now we know that if F is 240, A must be 180, 
is 180. 180 plus 60 is going to give us 240, which means the ratio that we're looking for in favor of uh, ratio of people who voted in, for, in, in favor or against is 240 over 180. But that's only when we put the information from statement 1 and 2 together. The answer is C. Each statement by itself does not get us anywhere. Number, two, number 279. Number 279 is asking us how many men there are in this club. We have some certain club and the question is how many, how many men are in this club. The first statement tells us that the ratio of men to women is 3 to 2. Simply knowing the ratio of male to female does not tell us how many males there are. It does not do anything. We cannot figure out how many men there are simply by knowing the ratio of men, uh, men to women. Second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that they all fit in six vans. There you go. By golly, that's very useful. Second statement goes on to tell us that if you were to put them in van, they can they can all fit nicely in six vans. That's just silly. How can we figure out how many men there are simply by knowing that they all fit in six men? And even when we put them together, knowing the ratio of male to female and knowing the fact that they all six fit in six men, it's just silly. The answer is E. They're just, they're just playing with us. They're just having fun with us. They're just having fun with us. They're just being silly. Your job is to make sure that you don't let them have fun. Just move on. 280. We're told that uh, we have a jar. we told that we have a jar which contains red, white or blue marbles. What we want to find out is, what we want to find out is, if we were to pick one marble at random from this jar, what are the odds that the marble that we pick at random is blue? Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement they give us two pieces of information. They tell us the total is 12 and we are told further that there are eight, eight of them are red. So we have two bits of information. We know that the total is 24 which means 24 has to equal R plus W plus B and we know that R is 8. But that does not tell us how, we could, there is no way to figure out how many blue there are because we don't know how many white there are. Until we know how many white there are, we cannot figure out the number of blue and until we, do no, until we figure out the number of blue, we cannot figure out the odds of picking the blue marble at random. First statement by itself is not enough. Answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be either B, C or E. The second statement tells us that the odds of picking the white marble is one half. Simply knowing that the odds of picking the white marble is one half and not knowing anything else, anything else at all. Don't look at the first statement anymore, just second statement by itself. Simply knowing that the odds of picking the white marble is one half, it just tells us that half of all the marbles are white. There is no way to figure out how many blue there are. But when we put them together, we can get someplace. Knowing that the, prob the probability of picking a white marble is half, which means, and knowing from the first statement that there are 24 24 total marbles and the odds of picking white marble is half, which means the white must be 12. And now we can figure out the blue. Blue must be 4, therefore the odds of picking blue is 4 out of 24. The answer is C. Two eighty one. In 281 they give us this picture. And they tell us that this distance is Z. And our job is to figure out what the Z is. We also told that this is a right angle, which is a very important piece of information. We are told that this is X, this is Y, 
and what else we were told? We were told that this was W. So this is all we have. We want to find out what this distance is from here to here, which is what they're calling a Z. This is a right angle. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that x equals y equals 1. Let's see what we can do with it. If x equals y, which means from here to here is also 1, which means from here to, to here is also 1, but we still don't know what this distance is. And until we figure out this distance, we cannot figure out the z. z is obviously 1 plus that distance, and we don't know what that is. The first statement by itself is no good. The second statement tells us that w is equal to 2. w is equal to 2. Now technically, technically when we're looking at second statement, I should technically erase everything on the blackboard and put down w equal to 2 by itself. But I'm not going to erase everything. Just remember not to look at this thing. We don't know this. We don't know this. We do not know this part. This, this does not exist. Simply knowing that w is equal to 2 does not tell us what z is. Second statement by itself is no good. It's only when we put them together, now we know that this is 1, this is 1, this is 1, this is 1, and w is 2. If w is 2 and this is 1, we can figure out this part. Let's call this thing, I'm just going to call it a. So a is simply going to be 1 squared plus a squared equals 2 squared. Just, just simply, simple application of Pythagorean theorem. 2 squared equals a squared plus 1 squared. We can figure out the a. Once we have the a, we can figure out the z. Number 282. Number 282, the very last problem on the page. 282 says, what is the 10% of y? They're asking us, how much is 10% of y? Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that the 5% equals 60. Or obviously 5% equals 60, 10% equals 120. The first, first statement by itself is quite enough. This is a gift. Sometimes you come across a few questions which are just too easy, they're too silly, what, what I call gifts. These are gifts. First statement by itself is quite enough. Second statement tells us that 80% equals rather it tells us that y is equal to 80% of 1500. But there you go. All you have to do is figure out what 80% of 80% 80, 80 of 1500 is, and that's your y. Second statement by itself is also enough. The answer in this case is d. That was the end of that page number 282. That's the end of that page and that seems like a logical place for us to stop. So we're going to stop right here, we're going to pick up, we're going to meet tomorrow and we're going to pick up from the next page from number 283 tomorrow. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, if you would like to work with me, if you would like to hire me to help you get ready for the exam, you can get hold of me by simply sending me an email. Go to my website at kashwaniprep.com. From there you can send me an email or if you wish to send me a little bit more about yourself, you can fill out the form and we'll talk some more. Alright, bye now.